surviving infidelity. My, 29 male, ex-fiancé, 29 female, cheated on me 4 years ago. I picked myself up and came back stronger than ever. This happened some time ago, but I thought I'd share it in the hopes of showing people who have been destroyed by infidelity that your world is not over, and that things can only get better from here on out. Disclaimer, names and some minor details have been changed for identity protection purposes. I met my ex-fiancé, let's call her Jane, seven years ago in a coffee shop. I was standing behind her in a long, slow-moving queue and we just started talking. We hit it off immediately, and even sat and drank our coffee together for about an hour. We eventually exchanged numbers before going our separate ways. At first, I was very hesitant to get serious with her, because I had just started as an analyst at a large investment bank and the hours were absolutely brutal, think 70 to 80 hours a week when things were slow and up to 120 plus when we were on live deals. I had also heard many relationship horror stories from my fellow junior colleagues, about how all of their relationships had failed due to the crushing hours and not being able to see their significant others on a consistent basis. However, after a few dates with Jane, it was clear that I was falling for her, and that she had felt the same way about me. I brought up my concerns about my work hours causing our relationship to fail, and she told me that she really liked me, how it would be a shame if we didn't even try, and that if we stayed committed and were understanding towards one another, any storm could be weathered. She was true to her word, the next three years were filled with Everest-like highs and hellish lows, but we persevered. She was patient and understanding, and never made me feel guilty about all the super late nights spent at work and not with her. She showered me with love, care, and affection and often told me how grateful she was to be with an amazing person like me. I in turn, did everything humanly possible to love her like she deserved to be loved. To everyone's surprise, after the end of this three-year period, we were going stronger than ever, whilst all of my fellow analysts' relationships crumbled and burned. During this period, I decided that the time was right for me to start recruiting for private equity roles. If successful, my hours would be drastically reduced and my already insanely high pay would increase even further. I also decided that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Jane, this amazing woman who had stuck with me, even through my sucky banking years as a junior. I bought a ring and proposed to her while we were on vacation in Spain. She said yes, and I was on top of the world. Now, this is the part where everything goes to crap. She was in the shower one day and had left her phone on the bedside table. I had just the slightest urge to snoop. At this point, she had done nothing at all that would lead me to suspect that she was cheating and I had no gut feelings that something was up and what not. I just had a slight urge, and it's not like she was ever going to find out that I had snooped. Long story short I snooped and I found a name, female, in her chats that I didn't recognize. I clicked in and what I saw, simultaneously enraged me and broke my heart. Lots of sweet nothings, nudes etc. Even some texts of them comparing the size of my manhood to his. What made all of this worse was that he looked to be taller than me and was far better looking than me. I am 5 feet 9 inches and only slightly above average in the looks department. I was shaking quite badly, and feeling so sick that I put the phone down and went out to have a breather. My thoughts were racing as I strolled down the pavement. My first thought was that maybe this was my fault and that she just wanted to feel loved and I couldn't give her as much attention as she needed due to my work, pathetic right? I wanted to confront her when I got back, but I was afraid to because I loved her dearly, and my confronting her might ruin us. My thoughts continued running wild, ranging from, hey this isn't that bad right, it's just a couple of texts, it not like they had s, you just have to put in a little more effort and she'll love you again, Two, how dare she do something so disgusting to you behind your back. I ultimately decided that I needed more proof before making a decision, as if the texts weren't enough. I went and bought a small camera and hid it among some stuff atop a shelf in the corner of our bedroom. I activated it the next day before going to work. Later that night at around 10, I activated the camera and saw exactly what I was hoping not to, but expecting to see, her getting railed by the guy that she was exting on her phone. All hopes of reconciliation and any love that I still had for her was thrown out of the window instantly. I threw up in the bathroom and immediately left the office for my best friend's house, let's call him Owen, where I broke down and cried harder than I have ever cried in my 25 years of existence. When I had calmed down, me and Owen sipped on stiff scotch, and planned my next move after I was done venting. We talked throughout the night until the next morning when we both had to leave for work. He suggested that I don't confront and end my engagement to Jane outright, but instead act cordial around her until I had a found a new job, hopefully in private equity and a new flat then block her phone, email and on all forms of social media etc and move out while she's at work. 
one day I'd be kissing her goodbye in the morning, and next, I'd be gone like I never existed. That would hit her like a truck, he told me. I was 100% on board with this plan, but I told him that I'd prefer to move to a whole new continent, probably New York where I'd truly be gone. He told me he'd miss me if I did so, but if that was what I felt was necessary he'd support my decision. I trudged into work like a zombie later that day, but the massive weight weighing me down had been lifted considerably. The next month was the most difficult that I had ever had to endure, being around Jane anytime I was at home and having to act normal was excruciatingly painful. I could barely look her in the eyes without feeling the urge to physically harm her. But I managed to put on a brave face and act affectionate towards her. We even slept a few times, which left me feeling disgusting and weak. She had told everyone that we were engaged, and when she brought up the wedding, I lied that we might have to wait a few months as things were heating up at work, and I would be overwhelmingly busy. I gave the same answer to the hordes of mutual friends and family, who were now calling to wish us congratulations. I broke down in the office toilet a few times late at night knowing she was probably sleeping with AP at that very moment. It was a miracle that I managed to hold out for as long as I did. Me staying at the office as late as possible or just walking around the city when I finished earlier than usual helped. Meanwhile, I was reaching out to headhunters in New York hoping to recruit for private equity associate roles there, whilst simultaneously studying for their LBO modeling tests. I had also told my other close friends what I was planning to do, and they all told me they'd support me 100% no matter what I decide. After a few weeks of interviews with headhunters, I had a few interviews with New York-based private equity firms lined up. Everything was going just as planned, but this is isn't a fantasy world, this is life, and life soon threw me a curveball that shattered my plan completely, but not in the way that you might be thinking. I went out with Owen and another one of my friends, let's call him Antoine, one Friday night and we ended up mingling with a group of people that Antoine knew. Among them was one of the most beautiful girls I had ever seen. I talked to her for a bit and we got on well. Her name was Elisa and she was Swedish. She was absolutely stunning and looked like Elsa Hosk, she wasn't like Elsa Hosk's identical twin, if you put them both side by side, you'd know who was Elsa and who was Elisa but you get what I mean. We had a lot in common, namely she was doing her masters at my alma mater and as a matter of fact, was doing the exact same program that I did, and that we had both grown up in Asia. I was planning to jet off to New York ASAP but I just couldn't resist exchanging numbers with her. We ended up going on a few dates and sleeping together. I had never felt this wanted and understood by anyone before, not even by Jane in the early stages of our relationship. And for the first time in weeks, I was genuinely happy. One night after sleeping together, we confided in each other our deepest feelings. She brought up how she was cheated on by her ex, I didn't prompt her, and how she hated and had absolutely no respect for infidels. I then explained to her my current situation and she laughed, not at me, but in amusement and in awe at how I was going to drop a sledgehammer on Jane. She then asked me if there was any chance that I would stay and not leave to New York. I said I would consider it, but deep down, I no longer wanted to leave. I of course had no intention of getting involved with anyone, but Elisa was just so amazing and I couldn't help but fall for her. Her views on infidelity also somewhat reassured me that she would never betray me in such a horrible way like Jane did should we end up together. What a massive curveball she was. Now. Some may say this is cheating on Jane and I'm just as evil as her now. I disagree with the former, because she cheated first, so from that point on, I had no obligation to remain faithful to her any longer. I agree with the latter, I am a savage. After interviewing with multiple firms, I got an offer to join the New York office of a large private equity fund. After inquiring about joining the London office instead, the managing director put me in touch with his counterpart in London. Two interviews later, I received and accepted the offer to join the London office. I was overjoyed. For anyone not in finance, an investment banker managing to make the leap to private equity, is a considered a massive step up. I held a small celebration at my flat after my first day at the new fund to commemorate this achievement. Owen, Antoine and his significant other, Antoine had recently made the jump to private equity and his SO worked at the fund I had just joined, and another friend came. I asked Elisa to come too and she gladly accepted. She came the latest, but when she showed up, she gave me a kiss and a hug telling me how proud she was of me. I closed my eyes and held her for an extra second, savoring this moment. We sat around the island in my kitchen, talking, laughing, and just having a splendid time. Just then, Jane came home, it was 1am at the time, she could have had a busy day at work, but had most likely just finished sleeping with AP. We glanced at the door to see who had just come in but otherwise didn't acknowledge her presence, 
Everyone at the table knew precisely what was going on. Elisa had her hand around my shoulder when Jane got back, but didn't put it down. All of us just continued talking and not letting Jane's presence disrupt our good vibes. Jane tried inserting herself between me and Elisa, quite awkwardly I might add, but ended up having to sit on my other side. We continued our conversation, pretending that Jane wasn't there. I ignored her too and had my body turned towards Elisa the whole time. I could sense that Jane was extremely uncomfortable. At around 2, everyone decided to pop off to go home and get some sleep. I opened the door and showed everyone out then after some deliberation, put on my shoes and followed them. Jane asked me where I was going with a tinge of worry in her voice. I'll be back in a bit, I responded and closed the door before she could respond. I woke up at around 8, Elisa was still asleep next to me so I just planted a small kiss on her head and headed home to carry out the final stage of my new plan. I had silenced my phone before going to bed because it was blowing up with text messages and calls from Jane. When I got home, Jane was sitting at the island looking dejected, her eyes and nose were red from crying. If this was before she had betrayed me, my heart would have broken for her and I would have done anything to cheer her up. But after what she had done, I felt nothing, not even a shred of sympathy. Where were you? She asked. I fell asleep in the car, I replied, I didn't own a car, but at that point, I didn't even care if my answers were incoherent, got to freshen up and get to work. I then hopped into the shower. I got out and put on my suit, then realized that she had to feel at ease if she was to leave for work, and she couldn't be at home if my plan was to succeed. All dressed up, I got out of the room, approached Jane and gently placed my hand on her cheek. Look, I told her in a gentle tone whilst looking into her eyes, I have to go to work now, but I promise you'll come home earlier today to talk about this okay? I then kissed her forehead gently and told her I loved her. That was the last fake sincere kiss I ever gave her, and I was glad that I never had to do it again. The final stage of my new plan was to move out and ghost her, but instead of moving to New York, I would now be moving into the new and vastly more luxurious flat compared to my current one, that I had secured the previous week in an affluent neighborhood near the city center. I had taken a day from work to move out, because weekdays were when Jane was away from home for the longest and most consistent period of time. I met up with Owen and Antoine for breakfast at a nearby restaurant, they too had taken a day to help me out. When we were done, I checked her location on my phone and sure enough she was at work. We went back to my old flat and packed all of my things that I hadn't moved to Owen's flat into his car and left. I did feel a little sad leaving the flat that I had called home for the past three years but, this was a new beginning and change isn't always easy. The lease on the old flat was in my name and it expires in two months. But with my new salary, two months worth of rent at the old flat was nothing to me. Besides, paying two months worth of rent to have my trader of a fiancé's life fall apart was quite the bargain. After I moved out, life was incredible. My new job was amazing and I was enjoying myself. I had a lot more free time now. I started boxing regularly again and actually had time to sleep at night. My friends said I look a lot healthier and happier, I felt that way too. Me and Elisa made our relationship official and we were extremely happy together. She even managed to get an offer to join a different private equity fund straight out of school, which is a very impressive feat. I can say that I was happier than I had ever been since leaving school. As for Jane, my disappearance hit her like an uppercut to the chin that she didn't recover from for a long time. All of my friends were bombarded at one point with messages and calls from her, asking about me. I had blocked her from everything, phone, social media etc. She still had the engagement ring I gave her, but my plan wouldn't have been much of an uppercut if I had asked for it back. As for her relationship with AP, I never found out nor did I care to find out what happened to them. If he wanted her, he could have her. Trash always end up together in a pile. One day at work, after a morning meeting I was walking back to my cubicle when I was greeted by an unsightly guest, a livid Jane standing between me and my cubicle. She lunged forward and started attacking me streams of expletives and vitriol coming out of her mouth while she tried to slap me in the face, I deflected her blows easily. My cubicle mate Giara and another colleague hurriedly restrained her. She fell onto her knees sobbing and droning on, I was so worried. I missed you, where did you go? I love you. How could you do this to me? I calmly took out my phone, found the videos of her and AP getting it on and played it, shoving the phone in her face. I still find myself laughing at the look of horror on her face when I think of it sometimes. She started hyperventilating. Look, she said through her heavy breathing, I can explain, it's not what it looks like. I couldn't help but burst out laughing the line, it's not what it looks like? It was clearly her getting boned by another guy that wasn't her fiancé. 
I wanted to yell at her and rub all the BS that she'd done to me in her face. But in reality, it had come across as me trying to convince her that she did something egregiously wrong. She knew full well that she had messed up big time, and the guilt was already consuming her. OP, look at me, she continued softly, I love you, I will always love you, as long as the sky is blue, I will love you. Here in London, the sky's always grey, I quipped back with a straight face and a smug tone. Kiara covered her mouth with her hand, stifling a laugh. Jane's tears were still in free flow as security intervened and escorted her out of the office. Another dose of karma hit Jane literally an hour later. I had arranged to meet with Elisa for lunch. When I got to my building lobby, she was already waiting for me. We kissed then walked hand in hand towards the exit and right into Jane's bewildered face. There was an awkward pause, with the three of us staring at each other. Jane proceeded to fall on her knees, again, and started bawling. Probably just jealous that I'd left her for someone far more beautiful or probably just consumed by guilt and regret. I'd never know, and frankly, I don't care to know. Me and Elisa just sidestepped her and walked out into the open. The rest of this story involving Jane just has to do with the engagement and her friends and family, but that's a story for another time. As for me, life is still amazing. I was given the nod for VP, Vice President, promotion at my fund last month and am on track to make partner before I turn 40, hopefully. Elisa has become my new fiancé. I proposed to her last summer and she tearfully accepted, we love each other dearly. We plan to get married when the pandemic is over and are already talking about having children together. The new lockdown really sucks for everyone, but we are very fortunate to have each other to count on during such trying times. That's my story guys. I just wanted to share this in order to show that if you're a victim on infidelity, it's not the end of the world, you can always bounce back, level up and reach new highs that you never thought possible. Have a great day everyone. Now for the last story. My wife, 34, hides our marriage at work and with her friends. I, 32, and her have been married for the past three years. I'm confused what to do. We are married since two years. Things were difficult for us because my family was not ready for the marriage yet. But anyway, we went ahead and registered for a court marriage. My family is fine with us now, but don't involve themselves too much. There have been ups and downs, and we don't stay together all the time. In about a week, I stay three to five days with my wife and two to three days with my family. The relationship is fine, although there have been a few problems as well. After about a year since our marriage, we fought and broke up for a week. But then gradually we made peace. A few months later, I found out she was too friendly with her co-worker. I was not aware of it, but I just happened to check her phone and then she didn't let me read the conversation with this co-worker. I believe it was her boyfriend, so I broke up with her again for 6 to 8 months. After this period, we got along again. With me being half-hearted. But anyway, she was applying to a new job recently, when she said she was not married, which was a shock for me so I confronted her. She put up some SHD like we don't stay together and I don't have a job, and we are not like regular couples and stuff like that. I'm confused, even if I don't have a job temporarily, lying about being single and denying the marriage is something hard to swallow. Also, I don't take any financial help from her, so I'm no burden on her. What should I do? I'm a bit attached to her, but is it worth going ahead in this marriage? Now for the top advice. I'm hella confused as to how you're married but not living together. Why did you get married if she doesn't want to tell people about you, you're half living with your parents, and you're not working to support the life you're building together? I don't understand, you're married and think she has a boyfriend? You spend one third of the week with your family? You two don't need to be together. She had a boyfriend earlier, now he's not there. I'm not even sure if it was her BF, but when she didn't let me read their conversation, I guess it was her BF. One third of the week with my family, and wife lives in a different home. You're confused, I'm confused. You broke up with your wife and don't live with her? Might be legal, but sorry, not really a marriage. Some employers may discriminate against a married woman, figuring she could get pregnant at any moment, she won't tolerate travel, etc. More likely she wants to make herself seem single so she can get another boyfriend like she has done in her past. The fact that she's cheated before and is hiding the fact that she's married, certainly points to that conclusion. That's it for this video guys, if you have thoughts to share, leave a comment below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you like this content. I'll catch you in the next one. Good day everyone.